The ZWC star took all of these images. These were all post-processed to highlight the excellent data that you can collect with this tiny thing. And although there's a lot of room for improvement, this proves that the C-Star is not that bad. A few months ago, Et Ting released a video on the C-Star S50, and he started the video by saying that it's not that good. After watching the video, I thought I would address some of his concerns, and this is not a direct rebuttal video or anything, but I thought his video was a great starting point for my review. And this is the first time I've used a smart telescope in my almost 13 years of doing astrophotography. Before we move any further, I want to clarify that I don't own the C-Star. It's owned by my friend Jesse Carter. His Instagram link is in the description below. Give him a follow. He is an amazing photographer. So thank you, Jesse, for letting me borrow this for this video. So let's take a look at the specs really quickly because I'll be referring to them quite a bit in the video. So first, this thing weighs two and a half kilograms or about five and a half pounds. The sensor inside is an IMX 462 sensor, which is a pretty tiny sensor giving a resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels. It has an aperture of 50 millimeters and a focal length of 250 millimeters, making it an F5 telescope. It's an apochromatic triplet, and it has two built-in filters, a UV IR cut filter and an O3 H-alpha narrowband filter, 30 nanometers and 20 nanometers bandpass respectively. It also has an external ND5 solar filter that you can use for white light solar imaging. You can take exposures of 10 seconds, 20 seconds, or 30 seconds. These are static values that cannot be changed. This provides Altas tracking officially, but unofficially there is a way to do equatorial tracking. Since this is not my C-Star, I don't feel comfortable exploring that option at all because it's not officially supported. You can connect to this using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or USB-C. It has a built-in 6,000 milliamp hour battery, which can give you about six hours of imaging time, less if you're using the built-in dew heater, but you can also provide it an extra USB-C power, either through a wall plug or through an external power bank for more juice for your night. You can control it remotely using a phone or tablet, and generally it costs $500, but at the making of this video, it's $449. And over the last year, I remember this being the third time that this has gone on sale, so I think the sales are pretty frequent. And if ZWO is coming up with a new version of the C-Star, maybe there will be a more permanent decrease in price coming soon. So Ed's biggest concern about the C-Star is its performance. And I can totally see where he's coming from, and I agree with a lot of what he's saying. Beginners who are getting into astrophotography with the C-Star will probably not see these and probably won't even care. But seasoned astrophotographers like myself do notice these as some of the first things that we see because we have years of experience that we can compare to. And I'll address some of it and also cover why it's not that bad. So first, the C-Star uses an IMX462 imaging chip. It's a very small chip. It has a resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels. Since the imaging chip is so small, the crop factor is very high, making it look like you're really zoomed in to whatever you're looking at. Here's an example of NGC 6888 or the Crescent Nebula through the C-Star versus the 60mm f4.8 refractor with a crop sensor camera. Now the way to get around that would be to do mosaics. No way to do automatic mosaics with the C-Star at this moment, but you can do manual mosaics. But that's added time and added effort that you need to do for the C-Star. So I believe that they use a small chip like that because first, the aspect ratio of that chip is almost perfect for a cell phone screen, and that's their primary target. And second is something else that Ed mentioned is that he noticed that there are some field flattening issues near the edge of the images that he's taken. And I don't, I haven't seen that with this uh, specific C-Star, it looks pretty flat. And I think that's because the imaging chip is so small. If it was any larger, we'd probably see elongated stars around the edges. And keeping the chip small is a great way to, to just crop in, make sure that there's no elongated stars around the edges. And that kind of makes sense because this is a triplet. It's not a quadruplet. There's no uh, field flattening element in this as you know we've seen anywhere in the documentation or online. So that kind of suggests to me that the quality control from unit to unit can vary. So we can look down the barrel of this telescope and see the chip itself. So the optics is air-spaced, and since it's all a closed system, we don't expect any kind of dust to get into the sensor where it'll require you to take flat frames. Although it's, I'm not going to say that it's impossible because I'm sure it's possible for a little bit of dust to get into the sensor, but at the moment, it's a closed system. We don't expect any dust, so no need for flat frames. On top of that, we don't need to worry about any kind of calibration frames, such as dark frames, because the C-Star will take uh, 
master darks for the different exposures and then apply them to each image. This is very similar to our DSLR settings where we can say reduce noise, where if you take a four second exposure, you'll notice that it'll actually take eight seconds because it's also taking a dark frame with the shutter closed and it'll apply that to that image. I wouldn't recommend that for a DSLR because it'll take time to save and add time or take time away from your imaging. But for the C-Star, it happens automatically. So no calibration frames, which makes it extremely beginner friendly. With that said, I believe that ZW could have put a little bit of a larger sensor in here, such as the IMX464, which has a resolution of 2688 by 1520 pixels, which is slightly larger, but it doesn't cost as much. And we see the IMX464 sensor in quite a few planetary cameras nowadays, and it's a great sensor. But of course, since uh, we are talking about field flattening, we probably would have seen elongated starts if these are 464 sensor, but you know, one can dream. And as with any sensor, there is some noise, but you can mitigate that by taking more exposures, which will improve your signal to noise ratio. And the C-Star does live stacking. And what that means is that it takes images and then it stacks them on top of one another as they're taking it. So on your cell phone or your tablet, as you're looking at an object, you'll see it get brighter and brighter and the noise gets lower and lower. It's a pretty cool concept, but it's not new. Live stacking has been around for years. Applications like SharpCap, has been doing it really well for a long time. And I think that's where the ZWC Star could make massive improvements right now since it's software based uh, because the live stacking algorithm that the C Star does is pretty basic and pretty bad. Beginners probably won't really see a difference in quality, but for people like me who've done live stacking before, if, you're, if you've done your own post-processing, you'll know that it could be better. Uh, SharpCap, for example, let's see play with the histogram live as they're coming in, play with the color balancing, play with the rejection algorithms and all that. The C-Star does not let you do that. You can mess with the contrast, you can mess with the brightness, and I think that's about it. But the one good thing that the C-Star lets you do is that you can save each individual image as it takes them so that you can extract them later onto your computer and post-process them yourself. But for many, the live stack version is more than good enough. I know when I first started doing astrophotography, if I was able to do anything like what this outputs as a live stack, I would be extremely happy. But now that I've learned all these different processes and all these different steps, the C start there is lacking for me. It may not be for you. But here are some examples of live stacked images compared to those that I processed in PixInsight. In the live stack version, we saw a little bit of green tint everywhere, and that's because the chip being used has a bare matrix of RGGB, where it has twice the green pixels than red and blue, so everything tends to look green. And the reason it looks greenish in the live stack is because, again, of the basic live stacking algorithm that's being used by the C-Star. It's really not a concern in post-processing because you can balance out the colors. A traditional imaging rig has so many parts. It has a telescope, it has a tracking mount, it has a camera, a focuser, a filter, a dew heater, and a computer to control it all. And all of that's built into this little five and a half pound box here. And I'm not even counting the guiding and the learning curve that goes with having all those different parts together. And yes, the parts are static. That means you can't change any of the parts that I just mentioned. But because they're all static and it's all built in, it's what makes it a great starter astrophotography rig. And for those who are experienced, I think this makes a great portable rig. For serious astrophotographers who have spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on their imaging rigs, something like the C-Star will disappoint if you keep your expectations too high. This cannot compete with a dedicated quadruplet or quintuplet scope with a cooled Astrocam and SHO narrowband filters, etc. So that's something to keep in mind if you are a serious astrophotographer and you want to get this. But for anyone looking for a secondary setup or a portable setup, the portability and the ease of use of these C-Star is unbeatable. With the C-Star, you simply place it on a tripod. Uh, you can use the tripod that comes with this. It's a really nice tripod. It's small and cute. It does expand out a little bit. It has 3 8 inch threading here and it's also 3 8 inch threading at the bottom of the C-Star there, so it plops right on. But you can use your own tripod. I've been using my SolarQuest tripod or my AZ GTI tripod. They're the same thing. Uh, because I get a little bit more height, it's a little bit more stable, but this is also really nice. And it all comes in a uh, styrofoam case, which is also nice coming from ZWO. So you put it on the ground on a tripod, connect to it on your phone, and you can start imaging within a couple of minutes. 
And from my understanding is that the first few versions of the firmware, you needed to make sure that the C-Star was completely level. Uh, but I believe that they worked that out where it can do a horizontal calibration and figure out just how much compensation it needs to do so that you don't have to worry about making it perfectly horizontal anymore. Because I know people have been buying that like the half ball head to help you level the C-Star more easily. I didn't have to do that. I did not have any issues with horizontal placement. I just plop it on the ground. Usually it's on a on flat-ish ground anyway, uh, and it works just fine. And you don't really have to worry about calibrating for the compass either because if you're doing DSO, it's going to do plate solving for you and figure out where it is and where it should point. The only time you'll probably need to do the compass calibration is if you're looking for the sun or the moon because it'll need to know uh, where north and south is so that it can start off pointing in the right direction when it's looking for the sun or the moon. And on top of all of that, uh, one thing that was a pleasant surprise was that this does automatic dithering. Uh, dithering is when there's a shift of pixels, like where you're imaging a little bit to, in order to get rid of walking noise. And it does it automatically. It's not something that I even thought about. It's when I started looking at the individual frames, I noticed that the frames were jumping a little bit here and there. And I was like, wait, is this thing dithering? And I did look it up a little bit and yeah, it is dithering. Excellent. The C-Star also comes built in with a couple of filters. The first is the UV IR card filter that you normally use on broadband objects. And the second one is a dual narrowband H-Alpha O3 filter. It has a band pass of 20 nanometers and 30 nanometers respectively, which is a little bit wide, especially compared to something like the L-Extreme or even like dedicated three nanometer H-Alpha filters, which are really fancy. And it's better than nothing and it'll work really well on narrowband objects, especially when you go to post-process these images because you can take out the H-alpha and O3 signal and process them separately. And ZW is constantly sending software and firmware updates which provides new enhancements and features, fixes bugs, and introduces new bugs. And the current assumption is that ZW will continue to provide those updates for a long time. There is no end of life announced anywhere yet. And it would be cool to get hardware updates over Wi-Fi though. Hmm. I believe the C-Star is versatile enough to last for many years to come, especially since it can do deep sky objects, it can do lunar and solar, which is nice. It can do landscape, which is which is something I haven't tried. I don't know if I will try it. And it can also do planetary, although I think this focal length and the aperture is a little bit too small to do planetary, but I'm gonna try it out at some point anyway. You'd want a bigger scope for planets anyway. And one concern that Ed Ting brings up about this, which is a fair point, is that once newer versions of the C-Star or other smart telescopes come out, uh, we'll start using these less and they will become e-waste that gets thrown away and it's just not great for the environment. And I do understand where he's coming from. And if you ever find yourself in that situation, I would ask you to consider two things. First, find someone who would absolutely love to give a telescope a new home. And this includes your local astronomy club. I guarantee you that they will take it no matter what condition it is. And second, find out if a local library has a library of things around you, which is where they lend out physical things. My local library actually lends out telescopes, which is excellent. I will probably suggest that they maybe order some smart telescopes because these would be great for outreach. And speaking of outreach, I've already hosted one star party this year, and I'm looking forward to hosting more because I want to bring this C star along with me because I think this would be a really great companion to my regular SCT setup that I usually use during planet season. I can point this to a deep sky object such as a galaxy or a nebula and just let it live stack, have it on my phone or on a tablet that's attached to the tripod. And I think it'll be a great hit with not just the adults, but the kids as well. And I think the potential for outreach for something like this is unlimited. It's a great way to introduce people to astronomy and astrophotography, especially from light polluted areas, because with the built-in light pollution filters and even without the light pollution filters, you can get great images just by taking short exposures and stacking them on top of one another. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, ZWO told me that they are working on a new version of the C-Star. So I have a handful of wish list items that I wish that they would implement. They're obviously not listening to someone like me when it comes to designing their uh, telescopes, but here's some things that I think would really improve their, uh, their system. So first, enhanced sensor resolution. I know that would make Ed Ting happy. I know that would make a lot of other people happy. So they're using the IMX 462 sensor. As I mentioned, the IMX 464 sensor would be a great improvement, but not that much more costly. If they can do that without raising the price too much, that would be excellent. So another thing that's, that it's probably not gonna be possible in a closed system, but one thing that I would love to see is to be able to rotate 
the imaging sensor itself or the imaging train so that I can turn and look at a nebula or a galaxy a certain way. So for example, when I'm looking at the Andromeda galaxy, it's pointing at it like this. When I wanna see it like this, and that would decrease the amount of panels I would need for a manual mosaic, assuming they don't give out an automated, automated mosaic system, it'll be just so much easier. But again, a closed system, much harder to do. Customizable exposure times should be easy to do. should be easy to do now. Come on, ZWO. And of course, I would love to see an equatorial mount officially supported, maybe some better uh, housing for this. This is plastic. So uh, maybe they're worried about, you know, the gears not being strong enough when it's, you know, rotating, you know, when it, at an angle. Who knows? But if they can support that, that would be great. And of course, the live stacking software can be vastly improved now. Like, they can give us control of the histogram so we can move around the black and white points, not just the brightness and contrast. Maybe give us some sliders so we can manipulate the R, G, and B so that we can get rid of the green tint. Another feature that I would love to see in this is automated mosaics. We can't do this here. I mentioned that we can do this manually by imaging one part of a deep sky object and then moving it to another part later on and then imaging that but we'd have to stitch that up in post-processing. You can't see that in a live stack. It would be great if we could do that automatically. We can do this automatically in pretty much every other capture software such as SGP, NINA, and ECOS. And along with automated mosaics, other planning features would also be cool, such as, for example, let's say tell the C-Star to image uh, one object without the, RG, without the narrowband filter for an hour and then switch to the narrowband filter later on. And that way we can do both RGB for the stars and narrowband for the nebula or whatever you're imaging and combine them later on. So you can do that manually now by turning the filter off, but it would also be great to see some kind of accessory compatibility with this thing, such as a filter drawer, which would be really nice. And this is probably uh, on my wish list and maybe on the wish list of others who like to do outreach. Maybe allow us to add like an external monitor to this so that we can plug this in and whatever is being live stacked is being presented on the monitor. It would make it so much easier so that we don't have to give up our phones or even a tablet to connect to the C, the C Star using the app and go to the screen, blah, blah, blah. If we could just plug it in and see what's being live stacked, that would make things so much easier. Of course, we can screencast from the phone, but I'm just thinking of the easy path to do it. We can use the built-in USB-C port that's already built in, or maybe give us some mini HDMI port somewhere. Just thinking out loud. And for a new version of the C-Star, different aperture and focal length combinations would also be cool. But of course, once we open that floodgate, the pricing floodgate also opens up because sure, they can bring out a 100 millimeter ZWC Star F4 that costs $2,000. And then we're in the same boat as the Celestron Origin, which costs like $4,000 right now. In conclusion, I think the C Star is a very impressive little rig, especially for the price point of $500. I think it's perfect for beginners, educators, travelers, and casual observers who want to dip their toe into astrophotography. While it may not replace a traditional astrophotography rig, it offers a very convenient and affordable way to explore the night sky. If you plan on purchasing one, consider using one of the referral links in the description below to support this channel. Please share your thoughts below and enjoy the images that I've taken with the Sea Star. Clear skies. one live stacking session during a start party using SharpCap. It was a couple years ago. It's turning off.